the day you were made. So I'll rejoice and be glad, rejoice and be glad in it. Come on, let's say you are. This is where I believe that you are more than enough, more than enough for me. Aren't you thankful today? You are faithful to your promise. You are strong when I am weak. When I'm standing in your presence, I have everything I need. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Yeah. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Yes, it is. And oh, my soul, bless his name, all that is within me, say, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Yeah. Oh, Jesus, come what may, you are worthy of all, worthy of all my today we say let it rise up like a river overflowing holy spirit and let it pour out with no limit overflowing holy spirit joy of the Lord is our strength, amen, and that in his presence is the fullness of joy. So, Lord, we worship you today. Hey, come on, let's sing. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Oh, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. And oh, my soul, bless his name.
Hallelujah. We're so thankful for the new life that we have in Christ. And today we're going to celebrate baptisms and celebrate the new life in Jesus Christ today. What is your name? Jacob. Hi, Jacob. Have you decided to follow Jesus? I have. Morning. What is your name? James Hands Gun. Hey James, have you decided to follow Jesus? Yes. What is your name? Angel. Angel, and have you decided to follow Jesus? Yes. What's your name? Brenda. Hi, Brenda. And have you decided to follow Jesus? Yes.
Good morning. What is your name? Sarah. Hi, Sarah. And have you decided to follow Jesus as well? A hundred percent. Good morning. What is your name? Ninoy Paul. And have you decided to follow Jesus? Yes, I have. I understand there's something that you want to share about what God is doing in your life. Yes, I would like to say if brokenness was a person, I was somebody that you could say. I was broke, depressed. I used to pray to God to take my life. But the moment I gave my life to God, I experienced a peace that suppressed all understanding. And I am grateful that he took me back again. Thank you. Y'all, it's very warm in here. Usually we have the opposite problem, but the heater is working. Good morning. What is your name? Uh, Wilson. Hey, Wilson. Have you decided to follow Jesus? Yes. And I understand that you also uh, have something that you want to share about what God's doing in your life. Um, yeah. Um, God has been uh, working in me, um, creating a new person in me, and he's basically pruning me out and just teaching me the way to go. And before I actually came last night, I asked the Lord um, whether if I should go or not. And as I was reading the Bible, I was just like continuing from yesterday. It said, um, Paul like made a little testimony and he said, he, uh, Ananias or something came over to him and he said, like, what are you waiting for? I rise and get baptized. And I just took that as a sign, you know? What's your name? Brittany. Hey, Brittany, have you decided to follow Jesus? Yes. What's your name? Kimberly. Hi, Kimberly. And have you decided to follow Jesus? Yes. What's your name? Isaiah. 
Isaiah, have you decided to follow Jesus? Yes, I have. What's your name? Giovanni. Hi, Giovanni. Have you decided to follow Jesus? Yes, I have. decided to follow Jesus? Yes, I have. What's your name? My name is Esther Mandel. Hey, Esther, have you decided to follow Jesus? Yes. And I understand that you want to share a little bit about what God's doing in your life. Yeah, I believe God has a calling on my life, and he called me on the second service to get recommitted to him, and that's why I'm here, and I thank God for second chances. Thanks. stand together and worship today. Let's celebrate the new life that we found in Jesus. Let's celebrate the new life that these believers have found in Jesus and all that God is doing. Come on, we declare together. But hell lost another one. I am free. Yes, I am free. Oh, I am free. Hell lost another one. I am free. I am free. Yes, I am. Come on, sing it out.
Lord, we're so thankful for your presence. Lord, we're so thankful that you see us and you know us. Lord, I pray that today would be a day that we build our faith in you. Lord, that we recognize your hand in our life, Lord. Give us a new revelation today to see your faithfulness. Lord, so that no matter what we're walking through, we can stand on your word, stand on your promise, stand on your goodness, stand on your mercy. Lord God, I pray that today would be a day that our eyes are open to see your hand in our life. Lord, don't let there ever be a day, Lord, that we're not in awe of your presence. Lord, help us to recognize it all around us, Lord. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you that there's never been a day, there's never been a moment that you weren't with us. Lord, we love you and we praise you. Come on, somebody, shout amen today. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Lord, we thank you. We're so grateful for our Savior. We're so thankful for the work that he does in our lives. Not just our story, but his story that we get to be a part of. Amen. Amen. We love this time together to get to worship and get to celebrate baptisms and the new life in Christ. But as we continue to worship today, would you take a moment, turn to your neighbor, welcome them to church this Sunday, and tell them what God's doing in your life. everybody doing this morning okay we're gonna try that again how is everybody doing this morning there we go we had some baptisms this morning so that's definitely something for us to get excited about because when someone makes a public declaration of their faith and their trust their transparency in Jesus Christ that is something for us to get excited about because those guys man it is tough getting up here in front of people and, and making that public declaration, but thank you guys and congrats for coming to join the family in a deeper way. So my name is John Setzer. I get the honor and privilege of serving here on the leadership team at Sioux Falls First, and I'm excited to see what God is doing in this community. You know, um, earlier we had a testimony of, of a guy in our church, and he was sitting like right over in here somewhere, and he was healed of diabetes, like healed. His doctor called him and said, I don't know what's going on, but you don't have it anymore. Like, you are healed. And so that is just amazing. So those things are happening all over the city. God is doing amazing things. Um, you know, between services, I had a student come up to me, and, and, and she was telling me about um, uh, the Z8 movement that was happening over at Sioux Falls Christian last night. And there was over 75 kids that got baptized at Sioux Falls Christian. And this is a student-led deal, so it was so cool seeing that happen. And so, um, how many of you guys are brand new here? Raise your hand if you're brand new. Okay, all right. Sioux Falls first, how do we welcome brand new people? Come on, we gotta show them love. And so if you're brand new here, I will have a QR code on the screen to where you can get uh, connected. And there's also connection cards in the back of the seat. And I want to let you guys know that here at Sioux Falls First, I don't know if you've met Pastor Quentin or not, or any of our pastoral team, but they absolutely love people and they will hug you until you turn blue. <laughs> and I'm telling you, so we love people and we're so glad that you're here to join um, our family. Um, lastly, so here at Sioux Falls First, we believe in radical generosity, and it's because of all of you guys that we are able to support so many ministries, missionaries, nonprofits all over the world that we support at this church because of your faithfulness and your giving. And so as the ushers come forward, the next portion that we'll go into of our service, you guys, how many of you guys know that it is worship when we get an opportunity to return back to God a portion of what he's given to us? You know, in my own life, me and my wife, Marcy, just what God has done in our finances because we were faithful with the little that he blessed us with. And so I'm going to pray 
But if you're here today, even if you don't have to have anything to give, I want to encourage you that God can also do an amazing work in your life. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to the name of your son, Jesus. Thank you for this day. Lord, we pray for every person here that has it to give and that, and also for the ones that don't have it to give, Lord. But I just pray that every seed that they plant in the ground would be multiplied. I pray that there would be a harvest, a 100-fold harvest of those seeds that are planted. And Lord, I pray that their seed would go all over the world, Lord, helping us reach the laws, bringing life change to a hurting and a dark and dying world. And Father God, we love you. You are an awesome and an amazing God. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. woman in this room has something that they're coming to the Lord with. It might not feel significant in comparison to other people, but let's not do a comparison game of who has the most trauma. No one's going to win that game. It's who has the greatest need. But if you need God to do something that only God can do, I want you to shout, I'm desperate. I am desperate. Me. I'm not making this up. I'm not preaching a point that I'm not living. I am desperate for God to do a miracle in my life. I'm desperate. And you know that desperation is often the seed of breakthrough. And you are faithful even when we are not. You persevere with us even when we fail you. You love us and you want us to keep going and we need to persevere. We can't quit. We are too close to the end. Lord, give us the faith. Give us the endurance. Give us the strength to finish this race. God, many of us are wondering and waiting and worried and worn out. It doesn't make sense, but your word says to shout for the walls that have been erected in our life. This shout is a declaration that we trust in you. It doesn't make sense. But you've given us a new promise and we need a new strategy. So we will shut up in March. One, two, three. Can we stand and give God a shout? Who's going first? Yes! Thank you, Jesus, for who you are. Thank you for what you do. To you be the glory, to you be the honor. We will march until we see you move. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Welcome home. My name is Ryan, and I'm on the Usher and Security team. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks for welcoming. What dream team are you on, Ryan? Usher and security team. That's awesome. I feel so safe what with you around. What dream team are you on? I'm on the worship team, and I am Tammy. Outstanding. Yes. Well, you know what? I want to welcome our online campus. It's so great that you're watching us today. We have a pastor online ready to welcome you and answer any questions you have and pray with you. So please reach out to them today. Right now, please take a moment to share our live stream with others so we can share Jesus with one another. We have some upcoming events. If you want to look at our Facebook page, Instagram, website, SiouxFallsFirst.com. There's so much going on right now. Again, that's SiouxFallsFirst.com. Instagram, website, Facebook, we're out there everywhere. We are super excited for child dedications that are taking place next Sunday. Register on our website at SiouxFallsFirst.com forward slash registrations. 
Midweek is now up and running for kids and teenagers at 6.30 each Wednesday night. Parents, this is your chance to get your kids in the Word. Bring them Wednesday again at 6.30 p.m. Your kids are going to love it. Hey, did you know we have a podcast? What's a podcast? It's this thing these Gen Zers are doing online. It's like they record something and just kind of put it online. I don't get it. I get it, and I think it's outstanding. Our podcast, Leading Life Change, new episode releases on the last Wednesday of each and every month. Sounds amazing. It is amazing. Dig in to this exciting new series. By myself, nada. But together, man, we are better. Much, much better. Yes, we make a big team. And because if you want to represent the we, not the me, you can get a shirt at the Cafe 1010 for $15. Message notes are available on the Uversion app. You can access them by going to More and then select Events. They're available in both Spanish and English. Oh, I'm only King James Version because I'm it's, saved. I, well, I'm NIV because I'm a newer individual. Oh, good comeback. New in Jesus. Okay. Get ready for an encouraging word. To are open you preaching? A, you know what? Maybe. Nah, not this maybe time. Maybe not. No, maybe not. Get ready, though. Open the word, God's word, and get an encouraging word today. Yeah. We welcome you to Sioux Falls first. I will tell you, you paid attention to the announcements today, right? I think we got some actors in the making, some spiritual gifts that are being revealed to us. And so, man, what an exciting day. We've had a great day. We're so glad you're here today, whether you're in the room or you're watching online. Pastor Anna's there. If you need prayer, you have any questions. And so we're glad you're here today. Um, you know what? I just want to celebrate with our ladies. Um, I know that you saw the video, but I believe they had anywhere from 360 to 370 ladies that showed up this last weekend from all over the region. And uh, here's the exciting news. Over 20 of them gave their lives to Jesus Christ. And so we are celebrating salvations today. I want to thank Jen and her team, a whole big team that helped uh, prepare uh, this house uh, for the ladies arriving, and we're grateful, so grateful for that. I also want to say thank you to those uh, that attended the Life Change Group Fair last week, went down to the gym. Uh, we saw that there was a tremendous engagement, I think, um, historically, it's the most people that have ever signed up uh, for Life Change Groups. We're grateful for that and grateful that you are, amen. Come on, give yourselves a hand. <laughs> grateful that you are prioritizing discipleship, you know, doing life together. Um, if you've not had the opportunity to sign up, the tables are still out there, the groups are there. You can sign up. And let me just say, you may show up and, and you may think, you know, this one's not for me. I need to keep, I need to check another one out. It's not going to hurt the Life Change Group leaders' feelings. We just want you to be where you can grow, uh, where God can minister to you and where you can minister to others. And uh, we're on the same team. It's all about discipleship. And uh, we're grateful that you're prioritizing that. Um, also just want to say, some of you have asked about um, our shirts. We have it in Spanish. We have it in English. Um, those shirts are available limited amount at the cafe. You can purchase them there. If um, they run out of your size, you can sign up and we will order it for you and uh, get that to you. But uh, what a way to kind of promote um, really the concept that God is communicating to us um, during this series. Uh, one more thing. I feel like there's a whole lot. But tonight at 6 p.m., uh, Paul Logan is in town, one of our missionaries, and we are actually um, attending a prayer for Ukraine. How many of you are praying for the nation of Ukraine? Amen. We need to continue to pray that the war will end, that God will minister to those people. And uh, tonight is an opportunity for us at the USF Fine Arts Center at 6 o'clock, I believe, till 730 um, if you want to be part of that, I know that they would appreciate that. If you have your Bibles or devices, go ahead and turn to Ephesians uh, chapter 2. And we're going to pray. Father, we thank you so much for this day. All that you've done throughout this day, we're grateful. And God, we are grateful, God, for those who are baptized in water, declaring publicly their faith, their relationship with you. And God, we recognize, Lord, the goodness of God in, in these people's lives. Father God, thank you for saving people, setting people free. We believe, Lord God, you're going to do something significant 
in this moment. God, whether people are watching online or in the room, Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit today would speak and challenge people. I pray that, Lord, that you would accomplish everything you desire uh, throughout this day. God, I pray you'd move in, in youth ministry and kids ministry and everything that is happening, conversations. We pray that Jesus Christ would show up in a powerful way in people's lives. Lord God, we love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. And everybody shout amen. 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 Well, let's do a little review of last week. Some of you may have seen this for the first time. Uh, Some of you, it's uh, a review from uh, childhood, but it goes like this. Here's the church. Here's the steeple. Open the doors in all the people, right? It's a visual of what we believe God wants us to communicate in our series, We is Greater Than Me where we are giving a biblical theology of the church and how the church is supposed to function in in the world that we live today. And we're using the metaphors that um, God has placed in the New Testament. And and here's the foundational principle that really is, is, uh, is being communicated on this shirt is this, that the church is not a building, right? We, we know that the church is not something that you just go to. It's not something you just check off the list every Sunday. The church is not a denomination, but the church is a collective of God's people, right? All generations, all cultures, even all people that have served God and loved God throughout history, we realize we are the church. And we are the little C, it's two false first, but we're part of, of the global church, big C, and grateful to see our part of the story and what God is doing through this place. And last week we talked about um, how the church is the body of Christ. And we use the illustration of a nail the nail of your life, demonstrating how we as individuals are called to connect to something much bigger than us, right? And, that, and that's the church, that we are to drive our nail into the purposes of God, and when that happens, the body of Christ is much healthier. We know that Christ is the head, and we are his body, and we are to fulfill his mission and his desires on the earth in in the day that we live. But today we're gonna be looking at how the church is meant to be the housing of God, the household of God, the the building. In fact, um, Ephesians chapter two, I want you to read with me, beginning at verse 19, and we're reading out of the NIV, so Tammy Smith will be really happy about that. Beginning at verse 19, consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too, you and I, are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Man, I'm grateful that we understand salvation is a relational and an ongoing transaction. We know when somebody surrenders to Christ, that we literally surrender our lives to him, we live for him, in which he makes all things new. For those who are in Christ, all things are passed away, and everything becomes brand new. And then Paul states to us that we're no longer foreigners, we're no longer strangers, but we are now citizens of heaven. We've been granted heavenly citizenship and we have a new country to call home. He also tells us that we are members of the household of God, which indicates that we now have a new family. And and then he goes on to say that we become the building where God abides, individually and collectively, which means we get a new purpose. So I want to take these three facets of new, and I want to share with you today how that would fit into us being the church and really helping us understand what our calling is, how we are to function 
uh, today as the people of God. Number one is a new country. You see, before Christ, the world was deeply divided along racial lines. It was the Jews and the Gentiles. And we know that the Gentiles were alienated from Israel and they were separated from the promises of God. And yet Ephesians says that when Christ came as one man in place of the two, he created peace by destroying the wall that divided us, the wall of hostility. You see, while we were sequestered and we were segregated from one another as strangers and aliens, we know that through Christ, we were first reconciled to God. Aren't you grateful for that? That we now have peace with God. We've been drawn near to God, but we also have been reconciled to one another. The body of Christ where we become citizens of the same country. Listen, man, as I was preparing for this message, I really felt like God dropped some thoughts in my heart that I pray are helpful for us. And I understand that patriotism runs deep in some of our bones, right? Um, regardless of what country we're from, and I, I think it's a good thing to be patriotic. And you know what? As crazy as our nation is right now and the challenging times that we are living in, whether it be politically or economically or spiritually, I am still grateful to be an American. I love our country. I appreciate that God has put us here. And yet I want us to read what Paul is speaking about in this passage. When he's talking about being part of a church that supersedes those things that separate us. As believers, we become part of God's nation. The kingdom of God is the greatest civilization known to mankind because it transcends cultures and ethnicities and national boundaries. In fact, the entirety of scripture speaks about how we become the people of God. We know that's why Christ came. We realize that was the prophecy in Genesis 3.15 that, that the seed uh, of the woman would crush, right, Satan would, would literally um, destroy him. And God was speaking about how Christ would come and Christ would, would build his church. And then we get to the end of the book. We get to Revelation where it speaks about how um, when we, we get to heaven, when, when we surround the throne of God, that we will be people from every tongue and every tribe and every nation. And we will all come together as the church and forever and eternally worship the Lamb of God surrounding the throne. And, and so with, with Paul indicating that and, and really this being a, a narrative throughout Scripture, we must keep things in proper perspective, right? It's important for us to have greater loyalty to our king and his kingdom rather than our earthly nationality. You see, when, when people see our actions, when people hear our conversations, they should be able to identify our Christian faith before they identify our cultural or even political preferences. In fact, our allegiance to Christ and his word should determine how we live in every facet of life. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. In fact, Philippians 3.20 also puts it this way, but our citizenship is where? It's in heaven. That's where our citizenship is. And we eagerly wait us wait a savior from there. The Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. And I will tell you this idea of finding our identity in a new country is a good reminder in our current political culture. In the time we are heading into election season. How many know in America we're always 
in election season. But it, but it really states this, that we are Christians before we're Americans. That's, somebody's not getting with me. We are Christians before we are Americans or before we are from any other nationality. We are Christians before we are Republicans. We are Christians before we are Democrats, before we're independents. Because the word of God indicates that we become fellow citizens of the country of God, this new country, this country that we call heaven. And I would say this, that if anyone has to set aside their Christianity or their faith to embrace a political platform, then it has become idolatry. And I feel like over the last several years, we've allowed some idols to emerge where conversations and where uh, we are more identified with our politics, we're more identified with things that are secondary to the reality that we are citizens of the kingdom of God. And again, sometimes we can get our priorities mixed up. Sometimes we can get our perspective wrong. And I believe what Paul is communicating very clear is what we need to embrace is this idea that we are now um, citizens of heaven and our lives should reflect that in all that we do. It should supersede the values of our lives. And so it should be said of us like in the hall of faith. How many want to be in the hall of faith, right? I mean, I, I want to be part of that. I want, I want God to recognize me. It doesn't matter who else recognizes me. It doesn't matter who else recognizes you. We really have an audience of one and we want God to recognize us. And in Hebrews eleven six, here's what it says. Instead, they were longing for a better country. Aren't you grateful that God builds a country that's so much better than what man can do on this earth? And he tells us that they longed, they longed for a better country. They longed for heaven. They longed for the finish line. And they it prioritized their life. It was, this was, eternity was their backdrop. And everything they did was based upon the backdrop of eternity as they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. And what you and I need to understand today is that we have not arrived at our country of, of origin yet. We have not arrived at the country of our true citizenship yet. We understand that that's what we're looking for. But we have been given that new country. Secondly, is a new family. You see, many of the greatest children's novels out there revolve around a plot about an orphan who finds a family. And when we watch those stories, when we read those stories, there's, there's warm fuzzies that rise up in us because of this idea of an orphan finding a family. It really speaks to this longing in our heart this human longing to belong, uh, to have a home, to be part of a family. And all of the riveting tales of orphans that we hear or read about finding families point to the ultimate story of the Bible, that God is a gracious heavenly father who has adopted us into his family and joins us with our redeemed brothers and sisters in a new family. And that is what Paul is speaking about. He said, you are now, as you've surrendered to Christ, you've given your hearts to Christ, that we are now part of the household of God, that we are part of his family. In fact, I love what Jesus says in John chapter 14, verse 18, when he says, I will not leave you as orphans, but I will come to you. And we had a guy respond in second service and he said, man, pastor, God was really speaking to me today and the enemy tried to keep me from coming. And he said, I realize that I have been living my life as an orphan my entire life. He said, I've served Jesus a long time, but he said, man, how I live my life and how I operate is, is, is really um, what you talked about today. And he said, I don't, I don't even know how to receive that identity as in the family of God. And I said, you know what's awesome about that is you don't have to try to figure it out. I said, because Jesus said, I'm not gonna leave you as an orphan, I'm gonna come to you. He said, I'm gonna come to you. You don't have to come to us first. He's always the initiator. 
He's always the one that is reaching out to us to bring us into the family of God. And man, as I was, again, preparing for this message, I really felt like the Lord um, spoke to me. I'm absolutely convinced that many of the spiritual ills, the moral ills that we are encountering today in society and culture really leads back to a separation from this spiritual reality. The lack of revelation of the Father's love for God so loved that he gave, that he gave his son so he could gain more sons and more daughters. In this lack of revelation in culture and society, the farther we drift from truth causes people either to yield their lives to the destructive effects of sin, the destructive nature of sin, or it causes them to embrace their past trauma, their past hurts that come from their family of origin or their, their relationships over, over time, allowing this to become their identity. Their identity becomes their pain. They live out of a distorted lens in, in the way they live. In fact, because of these negative or, or painful experiences they've, they've had throughout their lifetime, sometime in their life, or even, even accumulated experiences, they, they carry abandonment, they carry rejection, they, they carry fear, they carry loss. They, they carry these things that literally become their identity. In fact, some may call it an orphan spirit. It's an identity that lives apart from the perfect love that Christ revealed to us on the cross. I mean, I, it's a tragedy to see that. You know, some people that are, are living carelessly, some people that are living destructively or, are living out of their triggers, or living out of those things that, you know, have happened to them, that they've walked through, that creates a distorted view. And yet I love the powerful prophetic words of Psalms 80, 68, 6. It says God sets the lonely in families. That he wants to bring you and I into the family of God. That he wants you and I to understand the identity of the family of God that you and I have. And it also says that he leads out the prisoners with singing. These people that have been captivated, these people that have been, have been in bondage, these, these people that are living a distorted life based on their experiences that have been hard and, and hurtful and damaging, he says that he brings out the prisoners, but he doesn't just bring them out, he brings them out with a new song. He, he brings them out with a song of freedom. He brings them out with a declaration of, of a testimony of what God is doing and what God has done for them. Man, what a powerful thought today. In fact, no matter where we come from or what we have experienced in life, God is the one. He's the only one who is able to give us a sense of belonging by replacing our identity as an orphan with an identity as a son or a daughter of God. John chapter 1 verse 12 uh, tells us that those who receive him, those who believe in his name, he gives the right to become children of God. And, and you may be here today or you may be watching online and when you think of the word family, you, you think of the family you don't have. Maybe some of you today don't have a biological family. Maybe you feel alone because of that. Maybe you're here today and when you hear the word fi family, you, you think of something that's jacked up, something that's messed up. You, you think of something where your family uh, dynamics are, are really troubling and, and really a struggle. And, and God would say to you today, no matter where you are on the spectrum of what's happening in life, you can know for a fact that when you surrender your heart to Jesus, you get a new family and a perfect heavenly father that demonstrates perfect love. And, and some of you may have been on the treadmill of performance and thought, you know what, I, I, I can't surrender because of what, what I have accumulated in my own life, because of what I've done. And I love this because it says, God demonstrates his own love towards us. Not that we got it cleaned up, 
Not that we have it all together. Not when we get our ducks in a row. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, that's when Christ died for us. So God wants to remove the stronghold. He wants to displace the lie that some of us have believed that we have to perform for him to love us. That we have to perform to actually be part of this family. Not at all. In fact, he loves you enough to meet you where you are. As messed up as that may be, but he also loves you enough not to keep you there. That he changes us. He transforms us. And it's not on you, it's on him. It's not on you, it's on the Spirit of God and a sanctifying work of the Spirit of God. Aren't you grateful that he doesn't give up on us, that we're processed? That from, from the very time we come out of our mother's womb until our last breath on earth, that we're in process of being conformed into the image of his son. I'm so grateful for that. He grants you access to his family. And thirdly, a new purpose. The whole building is joined together brick by brick to become a holy temple in the Lord. And he says the foundation of the building, how many know foundations are important? He said the foundation of the building is built on the apostles and the prophets. I looked into that a little bit, trying to understand what, what God was saying and what he was speaking is, it is the, the teaching of the church. In fact, what is the only authoritative record of the apostles' teaching that we have today? It is simply the inerrant and the infallible word of God. The Bible is the exclusive and final authority of our rule of faith and conduct. No matter how much culture tries to modernize scripture or tries to indicate that it's an, an out of date document that needs to be updated that we realize that our roots are in the foundation of Scripture. And, and even when it doesn't speak to something specifically, it speaks to everything according to principle. So that means every culture, that means every generation, every society, God clearly communicates what he desires of us. And, and what Paul is saying, hey, the church that Jesus is building has to have the foundation of the truth of God's word. And I will tell you that we will absolutely be dedicated and loyal to the truth of God's word. And no matter what culture tries to do to, to change it up or to make us react differently to what's happening in society, absolutely not. We know what God's word says. We, we know the truth and it's absolute and we will stand by that because it's foundation. And if you have no foundation, you have no house. But then he said, Christ is the chief cornerstone. Now it's interesting because Paul was using language that the people in the audience understood very well. Because the chief cornerstone was the most important stone in the entire building. In fact, it was upon that chief cornerstone that every other stone, every other brick was laid. In fact, it became the plumb line. It became the measuring guide for the walls, for the roof, for the entire structure. That the cornerstone really determined the integrity of the whole building. So what was Paul saying? He's saying, Jesus Christ is the most important stone that the church is built upon. That it's all about Jesus. He's central to everything that the church is built upon. In fact, 1 Peter 2, 4 says, as you come to him, the living stone rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ Jesus. You see, the Jews rejected Jesus as the cornerstone. 
of salvation. But it doesn't change the fact of the role that God gave him. The son of God who was sent here to redeem lost humanity. The one who lived a sinless life and verified who he was by his death and his resurrection. And now his eternal reign. You see, Christ is the very core of the church's existence. It's all about Jesus. That when we come into this room and we lift up our songs and we lift our hands and we we present our offerings to him, it is for Jesus. That everything is unto him and because of what he has done for us, he has given you and I a new purpose. We realize the heart of the sinner longs for purpose. The heart of the sinner longs for meaning to life. It's a cycle of chasing those things that do not satisfy. We know they're longing for the Christ to come and fill the emptiness, the void in their hearts. And yet when we surrender our lives to Christ, we realize that now we have purpose. That life is more about, more than just waking up in the morning and fulfilling those things that we desire. It's more than showing up on the job and punching in and punching out at the end of the day. It's more than everything this world is offering us. But when we surrender to him, we realize now I have not just temporal purpose, but I have eternal purpose. Because he has set eternity in the hearts of mankind and all of us long for that eternal purpose that's only experienced in him. And it's in that moment that we become the habitation of God's presence. Again, it was important for them to hear that because many of them were looking back at the old covenant. And we know during the old covenant that God did dwell in buildings made by human hands and temples and tabernacles. We know that even in the wilderness that the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night indicated where the presence of God was. So when that began to move, they began to move with the presence of God because the presence of God was contained But it tells us when Jesus died on that cross and he was extended between heaven and earth, the Bible tells us that the earthly veil that separated heaven from earth was torn from top to bottom because God himself through the sacrifice of Christ was removing that which prevents us from walking into and experience the presence of God on a daily basis. From you and I not going into a building to experience the presence of God, but you and I becoming the temple, you and I becoming the place where God resides, his presence stays with us and everywhere we go, we take him with us. Because our purpose is to allow the presence of God to dwell in us. We become the church. We don't just go to the building, we become the church. What a beautiful, beautiful picture that Paul gives us tonight as I close today. I just wanna ask you guys, how many of you have ever shopped at Home Depot or Lowe's and you probably bought more than it was on your list. I'm gonna talk about, like you always leave more. I mean, that happens to me at Costco. Actually, it happens to me everywhere because I'm the kind of person that's like, you know what? I don't know if we have this, I pick it up. And I'm the kind of person that says, you know what? I may lose it, I'm gonna get two, (laughs) right? So if you've ever been to some of these home improvement places, you'll probably notice something. You will notice these piles of lumber that are are tossed aside. They're broken, they're cracked, they're warped, crooked. In fact, these inferior piles of lumber go ignored because the builders are looking for the perfect lumber to build the structure they're building. 
and we realize what builder would use the inferior lumber to build a building, to build a structure. And I would just say today that Jesus the carpenter does. He actually delights to use the crooked sticks, the lame lumber, the broken boards, that which society has and will continue to discard, that which society will throw away and say it's a waste. It's the very things that God desires to use. It's those things that God wants to use to build his spiritual house. He uses the blemished, he uses the damaged to become the very habitation of God's presence. It's actually a beautiful picture of God's grace. That what enemy doesn't want, that's what God wants. That God uses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. Man, man, God uses those things. And again, a reminder that, you know what? You may be here today and thinking, man, I'm, 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 my life is crooked. I feel like lame lumber. I feel like society has discarded me. I feel like society has thrown me away. Maybe you've encountered some of that in life and you need to know today that God is choosing you. You're a first round draft pick. God's choosing you. God's choosing you today. There's some of you that needed to hear because you don't feel like you've been chosen. There's some of you today that have walked through life and feel like you're tolerated. You've not been chosen. But you need to know that God chooses you and God celebrates you. As we spoke about last week, God made you and broke the mold. And he brought you here today to let you know that you are the very one, you are the, you are the very one that God wants to use in building his habitation. I'm so grateful today for that. I'd like to ask, ask you to stand to your feet. I'd like to ask our prayer team to come. With heads bowed and eyes closed across this place, and, and again, speaking to our online campus, you may be here today. And you know what? As we've shared the word, as we've declared the word today, some of you have really felt like you've been hindered from receiving Christ, from becoming a follower of Christ because you thought you had to clean up first. Because the enemy would tell you and lie to you that you have too much in your past for God to ever bring you in. You almost feel like God is, God is a tyrant. Some of you have seen God that way. Like he's carrying the big stick and he's ready to respond to you in a way that speaks about your shame and your past. And yet in this moment, I believe God brought some of you here, brought some of you online to tell you that no matter what's behind you, Jesus Christ is in front of you with open arms and he wants to save you. He wants to set you free. That's why he came. If something else could have done it, God would have said, God would have established that, but God had said, establish his son to come and live among us, to reveal to us how much the God of heaven loves us and wants to save us and redeem us. With heads bowed and eyes closed, you may be here today and that's you. Maybe you've ran away from God, you were a prodigal, you ran away from God, or maybe you've never ever invited Jesus Christ to become the Lord of your life. If that's you, would you wave at me? Anybody here today who say, that's me? Pastor, go ahead and pray for me. You pray for me. Anybody here today that would say that's me? Hallelujah, Lord God. Hallelujah. Amen. Here's how I feel like you can look at me. Here's how I feel like God really wants us to respond. I felt the Lord tell me that He wants to confront the orphan spirit in this house today. Because some of you have been living out of a distorted lens of how you see yourself. There's some of you that have lived like you're an orphan disconnected from a family. There's some of you because of family of origin or maybe it was because of relational things that have happened to you and things that were spoken over you and things that were done to you that you are living from a place of rejection. You're living from a place of abandonment. 
And maybe not everybody even knows that, but maybe somebody will say something and all of a sudden you, you feel the trigger go off and you have to kind of mask it because it, it goes with you everywhere because you go wherever you are. And, and you're battling that. You're battling fear and loneliness and rejection and abandonment. And I really feel like today God wants you to know that he wants to speak sonship over you. He wants to speak daughtership over you. He's the great physician that can go places where man can't go. And he wants to go in those deep places of your heart that maybe you've even buried and tried to tolerate, just tried to live with, but under the surface. And God is saying, nope, I want to go deep. And I want to heal those things so that when you look in the mirror, you know who you are and you know whose you are. You realize that you're a son of God, you're a daughter of God, and you don't live out of, even though you've had bro- 